Thank you very much. Uh, well, let me start by thanking the um, organizers for the invitation and possibility to present this work uh, here. Uh, so what I will be speaking about is uh, some problem related to characterizing rigorously certain aspects of uh, correlation functions in the singe gordon quantum field uh, theory in 1 plus 1 uh, dimensions. So I would like to start the talk by uh, first stating the main results uh, and also by providing some maybe motivations why focusing on such problems is interesting. Uh, then I will actually try to give at least a um, uh, crash review of uh, how actually the main result I will present in the first part arises in this singe gordon quantum field theory. Uh, so I will introduce a few, few aspects of uh, the integrable approach to this theory, and then I will, depending on time, I will try to give you at least a flavor of the flavor of the proof. Um, uh, and there, there will arise some connections with techniques which were uh, fruitful in the studi study of uh, multiple integrals arising in the context of random matrices. So uh, maybe let me start with motivations. So uh, so typically, well, um, irrespectively of what would be the origin of your integrable model, so be it some um, exactly solvable many body model of uh, quantum mechanics, a model of statistical mechanics, or some model uh, arising in the context of integrable probability. One is ultimately interested in computing some observables of the models, which globally can be framed under the name of correlation functions, which would carry all the information you want to access from the, from the model. Uh, and the very presence of integrability in your model allows you to build on powerful algebraic techniques to provide closed expressions for these uh, quantities and hence allow you to, in principle, uh, study them uh, through their exact expressions. Well, uh, typically, um, uh, typically uh, the correlation functions uh, like, uh, for instance, in the x, x, z spin one half chain, but they are the examples. Uh, you would be starting with some model which is in some finite volume L, and you want to compute a certain uh, expectation value. So, say, in the simplest case where you're at zero temperature, you consider the ground state of the model, and in your model, I don't want to enter into into more, more, more details of this description of the model, but in your model you will have some bunch of interesting uh, operators, which will depend on uh, uh, some space position in a local way, uh, and which, would, which can be evolved in time in the Heisenberg picture using the Hamiltonian of the model. Uh, and, for instance, you're interested in computing such a two-point function, so you take a finite volume uh, ground state of the model and compute this expectation values of such two operators and take the, the limit, and then um, the, the, the possibility to... Uh, the integrability allows you to write certain series of multiple integral representations for these uh, quantities. And so, what is this kind of representation? So you have a series where the nth uh, summand is a, a n-fold uh, integral, uh, which um, has certain integrand, a n, which is explicit. It can be really fairly explicit or given through some more intricate combinatorial expression. Um, so here, beta a n is a vector a n dimensional 
uh, vector, so the index indicates the dimensionality of the vector. Uh, one, uh, so a n is some sequence going to plus infinity with n. Typically, a n would be n or 2n. And you, you integrate over a certain curve c in the complex plane. And, well, since you had some uh, space-time dependence in your original object, you recover it uh, parametrically in the, in the integrand. So, well, this is the, the, the kind of typical form of the answer you can get, or at least uh, uh, argue to hold. Uh, but, of course, immediately when you look at this kind of uh, representation, well, I, I will not write the explicit forms of the integrands, but they are, they are explicit. You, you may ask yourself whether this kind of representation makes sense, namely whether uh, the series is uh, convergent. And, well, here the first uh, problems start to uh, arise. Well, you have a certain very particular class of quantum integrable models called pre-fermion equivalent uh, models. So these are basically um, um, models which, uh, uh, which are non-truly interacting. Then, uh, then the correlation functions are actually have a much, uh, and, and the fact that you don't have interactions in the model have a deep impact on the form of the integrants, because basically such kind of representations reduce to either fret home series or uh, fret home minus. So uh, typically, this kind of object will reduce to some fret home determinant of an operator identity plus k, which uh, with a kernel depending on x and t. And uh, and uh, you end up typically with series of such a form. And then, well, it's uh, very easy to statutate on the convergence because basically you can use Hadamard bounds for the determinant to. Uh, decomplexify in a certain sense the structure of the n-fold integral and typically the kernel is such that you, all the integrals converge fa fast enough and then because you have a 1 over n factorial here this ensures the convergence of the series and then well you can pose many other problems for such uh, fit home determinants like typically ask questions about x and t dependence and all, and all that. But, uh, uh, and basically, well, one can say that the, 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 the understanding on the fully rigorous grounds of free fermion equivalent models is complete uh, today. But, uh, but in the case of truly interacting uh, models, uh, you don't have any more header bound bounds because uh, I n is um, given either by combinatorial by, the, by some combinatorial expression, so some explicit uh, function which is summed over certain partitions, so things like this, or um, or uh, at least um, or at least has an intricate expression, for instance, is given by uh, some ratios of fit home determinants, which the, uh, whose co integral kernels depend parametrically on uh, all the integration uh, uh, variables. And so uh, there's definitely no uh, direct way to prove uh, convergence of such a series, simply because you cannot use simple bounds like the Hadamard bounds. In a certain sense, actually, if you would uh, look at the case of fret home determinants, and if you would forbid yourself to use the uh, Hadamard bound to prove um, convergence of the series, then, uh, well, immediately, uh, even this problem will become rather uh, hard to, uh, to tackle. Of course, one could say that, well, maybe it's just a kind of um, theoretical questions about uh, convergence in the sense that uh, uh, one could hope that because the representation is obtained in an uh, integrable model using uh, 
certain al underlying algebraic structure, then uh, basically the series, because you, can, you are able to construct it, should converge, and it's just a question of devising the proof. But actually, there are counterexamples to, to that. Mm, so, for instance, in uh, the beginning of the uh, history of uh, correlation functions in truly integrable quantum, uh, in truly interacting quantum integrable models, uh, Isergin and Korepin were really pioneering techniques uh, to, to compute um, the correlation functions. And in particular, they were the first to produce such kind of series of multiple integral representations. Uh, well, they, their work, of course, uh, involved uh, uh, at the time several uh, manipulations which were not listed, like um, exchanges of symbols, taking m limits without uh, justifying all the details, and etc. Um, and uh, at the time, they were interested in uh, actually computing the correlations, correlation functions in certain regime of the coupling constants of um, certain integrable models, like the x exe spin one half chain or the uh, delta function Bose gas to study um, certain predictions stemming from the expected arisal of certain universal behavior of such quantities where the parameters x and c become uh, very large. So starting from the, their series, they start to make a certain amount of resumation to present it in a good form where you will be able to send hex and t to infinity and extract the asymptotic behavior of the series. And by doing several kind of transformations of the series, they arrived to concept of uh, long uh, distance asymptotics, which have a near large distance and very far large distance uh, regime. And basically, this was uh, contra contra contradicting the um, predictions from uh, universality. So the only way out was that actually they, the, the, the series they obtained in the very first place were uh, not convergent series. Uh, so this is one example. Of course, I, I wouldn't like it to be taken as some form of criticism of their uh, work. It, they were really the pioneers. So the, even the very fact of being able to write any series for such quantities, even if it had convergence problems at the time, it was really an outstanding uh, step. Um, Okay, and actually the sole proof uh, uh, where you have a truly interacting model and where you're able to prove the convergence of a such series representation uh, is due to Fedor Smenov in the early 90s where he was able to prove the convergence for a specific case of integrable one plus one dimensional quantum field theory called the Li Yang model. His proof was built on a very um, specific structure of the summons uh, of the integrants in such, uh, in such representations in the case of this, uh, of this model. Uh, and while it was great to have a proof for a truly interacting model, the problem was that it was hardly generalizable to more general uh, situations. So then the, 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 the kind of um, results I... Uh, and, uh, activity where, where, where this result sets in, enters in the more general uh, framework of the um, open problem of devising general techniques for proving convergence of series representations for correlation functions in truly interacting a uh, quantum integrable uh, model so as to set at least the, these representations on a fully mathematical uh, uh, rigorous level. And uh, actually you have uh, two classes of models uh, which you should consider uh, in uh, priori well, one after the other. The first one is uh, interacting uh, QFTs in one plus one dimensions. So the simplest one and uh, non-trivial one is the Singe-Gordon model. And then you have a sine gordon model where you have already a, a really technical intricacy jump in, in respect to the structure of the, of the integrants. But still, for these models, the integrants have a slightly better uh, and simpler structure than in the case of lattice
models like uh, XXZ or uh, certain other models. Um, and uh, okay, so maybe one, one more thing one, one could say what would be another fall off of such a construction. Uh, uh, mm, so this fall off would, would, um, uh, would consider a, a sort of a further development of uh, the theory of special functions. So, as you maybe know, uh, the modern approach to special functions is to see them as matrix elements of representations of uh, classical uh, Lie groups. Uh, and then if you want to get a more complicated special functions, you should consider representations of more involved algebraic structures. And in this way, um, uh, for instance, uh, as pioneered by the Kyoto School, it was possible to represent certain uh, tau functions related with Panavé equations with matrix elements involving certain uh, representations of conformal uh, uh, field theory at central charge one. Uh, and of course, then you can ask yourself, what is the class of special functions lying above the panel of a transcendence, and is it possible to describe this class of functions rigorously? And then naturally, well, correlation functions of uh, quantum integrable models, you can see them as matrix elements of representations of uh, 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 Q deformations of uh, um, classical groups, classically groups, and so, um, and so, well, at least naturally this, this, this fits in into the scheme of special functions and actually, well, you have certain, f at least partially f uh, formal analysis of certain properties of these correlation functions and these properties indicate that they really lie above the Pan-Levé class. Another indication about this is that if you reduce to free fermion equivalent models, which is the simplest case of, true, of quantum integrable models, then your correlation functions are given by Fritholm determinants of operators identity plus k, where k is a, a integrable integral operators and special examples of such operators are uh, closely connected with uh, Panavé um, transcendence. So then if you're able to provide a, a well, rigorous construction of these series, you get, you get at least a, a series representations for a candidate of special, uh, of elements of special functions which are beyond the Panavé class. Now maybe uh, I can go to the, to the main result. Change the board. Um, so, well, as I said, I, I, I'm, I'm focusing on a convergence problem for series of multiple integrals. So, the first I need to introduce the multiple integral of uh, interest. So, it's an n fold integral which has a one over n factorial in two pi to the n as a normalization factor. There are n integration variables running all over Rn. And then the integrand has a threefold uh, structure. First of all, you have a one body confining potential, e to the minus r, hyperbolic cosine of beta a minus alpha hyperbolic inch of beta a. Then you have a two body interaction, Uh, which is of exponential form, e to the half of a certain function w of uh, beta a minus beta b. And then you have a coupling term, k n of p, which already couples basically all the integration uh, variables. So at least if you didn't have this term k p n of beta n, at least morally speaking, this would be an analogous to the kind of integrals which arise in random uh, matrix theory when you reduce, when you pick uh, random matrices, uh, Hermitian, orthogonal, or 
symplectic ensemble of random matrices and you reduce to integrations over the spectrum of these matrices for the partition function. Here this would be a kind of confining potential but not scaling with n and in the case of random matrices this two-body uh, interaction is just replaced by a log of uh, beta a minus beta b. So here R is a parameter which is positive for the integral to converge and alpha is a real number between minus one and one. Then the two-body interaction has an explicit form. It has some features actually of the two-body interaction which arises in the uh, case of random matrices because for lambda going to zero, one can show it has a logarithmic uh, behavior. So uh, the interaction, two-body interaction is repulsive on short distances uh, as in the random matrix case. And uh, this uh, two-body interaction is defined in terms of this um, uh, Fourier transform. You can uh, uh, typically, this two-body interaction has a form like this, and here it goes like minus, uh, like two log of lambda, and it's a even function of lambda. And then the multi-body interaction is, uh, it's, a, it's given in terms of a certain transform, which arises actually naturally in the study of the Sinch-Gordon quantum field theory. So uh, the transform uh, picks a certain function p, which depends on all the integration variables beta n, and also on auxiliary sets of uh, variables uh, lambda n, which run to the sets uh, with entries being either equal to zero or to one, and it's an n-dimensional vector. So we take such a function p of the beta n and ln, and then we weight it with some combinatorial factors depending on the L's. So there is a first a sign factor uh, which depends on the sum of, on the parity of the sum of all the L's. And then there is a factor which mixes the L dependence and the uh, uh, beta dependence. Okay, and uh, actually B is a parameter between zero and a half. B hat is half minus B. And later on, this parameter B will correspond to the coupling constant of the model. And now, well, maybe first of all, some remarks. So as you can see, well, at, at, as long as P maybe doesn't grow to, to, to uh, so, the two-body interaction is bounded. Uh, uh, at least the exponential of the two-body interaction is a bounded function. Uh, Kn of p, well, it looks like it's bounded at, at infinity. In principle, it can have some poles at beta a equals beta b, but actually the fact that the two-body interaction goes to zero logarithmically when beta a goes to beta b uh, ensures that uh, exactly this factor cancels out all the singularities stemming from Kn of p, so the integral is well defined. And moreover, uh, well, Kn of p, at least if p, this, this p function arising in the transform doesn't grow fast enough, uh, slower than the exponential of an exponential, then um, this confining potential ensures the convergence of the integral at infinity. And then the main result is the following. So, if you, were you take a function p of uh, beta n, and this, will, um, this hypothesis actually exhausts all the uh, interesting classes of p functions arising in the study of the Sinch Gordon quantum field theory. So if you have this p, and then you have some, some constant c1, uh, which does not, not depending on n, such that you can bound p for any n by c1 to the n, and you may even allow for a certain growth of p at infinity, so some constant c2 times beta a to power k, so some growth like exponent of the polynomial in each of the integration variable, and uh, c1, c2, k, 
are uh, fixed positive. Then, well, one can show is this, this multiple integral un of r alpha uh, is bounded by exponential of minus 3 pi to the fourth over 4 b b hat n square over log cube n 1 plus order 1 over log n. So, um, so, uh, so you have a slightly sub-exponential uh, decay of the multiple integral. Well, let me stress that, first of all, there is no uh, dependence on the parameter r and alpha in the integrand. Uh, in the leading asymptotics of the upper bound on the, of the uh, integral. So first of all, it's an upper bound. It's, it's, not, uh, it's probably not uh, satisfied where, and uh, it, it's probably not uh, optimal. Uh, it's enough to prove uh, convergence of the... Of the um, uh, it's, it's enough to ensure that... Um, uh, so the... the, 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 the uh, uh, it's enough to ensure that some uh, uh, that this series converges uniformly in kappa, which is the combination of one r times one minus alpha belonging to some kappa zero plus infinity with kappa zero strictly positive. So the upper bound is uh, uniform provided that the parameter kappa here is strictly positive. Uh, the control on the remainder already depends on r and alpha, and when you send r and alpha to zero, uh, then this upper bound breaks and something happens. But this is what you would expect from the uh, kind of um, Singe Gordon quantum field theory interpretation of this series because you accept some uh, power law behavior in the parameter r to arise when r goes to zero, and this means that something has to happen with, with convergence when r gets uh, small enough. But still, for finite values of r, you have, um, you have convergence. Um, yes? Um, yes, so in the singe gordon uh, field theory, well, you have the minimal form factor, it's f of uh, beta, so it solves the two-particle uh, bootstrap uh, program, and f of beta, f of minus beta, is e to the w of beta. So it's, it's closely related, indeed, to the, uh, to body, uh, uh, to, to the minimal form factor. Um, the second point I want to stress, maybe, uh, is that the decay is, is slightly sub-Gaussian. So compared to this 1 over n factorial here, this is much, much stronger. N factor 1 over n factorial goes like e to the minus n log n at, at infinity in the leading term. So it means that whether you have 1 over n factorial or not, it doesn't really play any role in, in terms of the, uh, the convergence. This can be slightly misleading because in the example I showed you before, actually the 1 over n factorial, when you use Hadamard bounds for the case of fred home determinants, it plays an important role for the, for the convergence. But uh, this is because the Hadamard bounds are really uh, overbound. Uh, and uh, those series actually for basically similar reasons to those which make uh, these kind of multiple integrals goes like slightly sub Gaussianly. Uh, this series should converge much, much fa faster than what follows from the Hadamard uh, uh, approach. And it also means that it is a very fine property because then uh, it's really the details of what you put inside which tells you whether this series is lower than something with exponent of minus or bigger than something with an exponent of plus times a Gaussian in N. So, um, so it's really, the, the con convergence is a delicate question. Uh, okay, so then maybe I can go to the second part, uh, where I would least, at least try to tell you where this series arises in the singe gordon uh, quantum field theory. So, um, 
the Sinch Gordon quantum field theory is a spe rather sp special quantum field theory because it's underlying to uh, uh, integrable classical evo uh, uh, evolution equations in, of one plus one uh, uh, dimensional physics. And well, one starts with such an equation and one wants to uh, construct uh, in a rigorous uh, manner the, assess the underlying quantum field uh, theory. So for this, you need to find or propose a Hilbert space uh, for the theory on which um, you will realize the symmetry algebra. So translation operator, boost operator, and etc. And then uh, what you want is to be able actually to um, lift the classical fields phi of x t, um, let me denote it, phi of x, where now x I uh, write as, uh, uh, in terms of its uh, time and uh, space uh, variable, or objects like e to the gamma, uh, the field, and etc., to operators. Um, P of x, E gamma of x, and you can consider many other classical quantities and raise them to operators. Um, and in such a way, that these operators form an algebra. This is already a very tricky procedure because actually uh, these are not just uh, operator functions, these are operator valued uh, distributions. So you sh one should be relatively careful in the construction of, uh, of these objects and in particular in the way you one prescribes how they should be multiplied. It's not at all evident that they can be multiplied. But uh, mm, in the end this is what one needs uh, to, to construct the quantum field theory. And uh, once one has uh, supposed, supposed that one can make sense of all of that in some appropriate way, then the next uh, point in line is to uh, actually have a theory which satisfies uh, causality. So this lift uh, here and, and also the Hilbert space in which all this is re realized, it has to be such that uh, the theory is causal. So suppose you have two uh, operators on your model, then if you compute the commutator, this should vanish if uh, y minus x square, which is y zero minus x zero square, so this is the Minkowski norm, uh, is negative, so the vector is uh, space-like. And once you're able to do all that, well, then you're in good shape normally to be able to compute uh, quantities where you take the um, sort of vacuum vector of your theory, and then you take a bunch of operators, or one at position x1, or n x position xn, and you want to compute it um, explicitly, ideally, uh, and in particular, compare with the formal um, uh, path integral. Uh, for small coupling constants. Um, well, and one way of saying this, actually, the fact that you're able to, 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 to satisfy such properties, in particular causality, implies you that the multipoint functions will satisfy the White Whiteman axioms. So um, it's an equivalent way of saying that you have fully constructed the uh, theory. And actually, well, in, in the general case, it's not possible to carry such a program explicitly. Sometimes it's possible to prove uh, existence of the theory, but without being able to say much about uh, the explicit form of such quantities. But in this case, because it's an integrable theory, you can uh, realize all this program fully explicitly with the help of the bootstrap program. So the bootstrap program was a program which was um, 
I think in, uh, initiated by Grianic and Vergeles, precisely on the example of the Singe Gordon quantum field theory and further race to full glory by the Zamologikov brothers, also uh, Fateyev, Smirnov, Kirillov, Kamitov, um, and uh, Karowski and uh, Weiss, which uh, aims at first characterizing the so called S matrix using the presence of integrability in your theory, and once you know the S matrix, you have actually set up a set of equations called the bootstrap equations, which allow you to characterize the operators of your, uh, of your theory uh, if you're able to solve them. So, uh, so let me just give you some, uh, how, how at least main, main ingredients of this construction for the singe gordon model. Uh, so first of all, the singe gordon hilbert space is uh, uh, taken as um, Fox space of L squared to the, of our ordered Rn. So Rn ordered uh, means um, sets uh, of vectors in Rn such that uh, beta one is greater than beta n. Uh, at least if you would like to interpret this Hilbert space in terms of the um, kind of formal picture of uh, incoming or outco outcoming scattering state, that then you would say that F, which belongs to Rn, is a sort of uh, incoming um, n-particle wave packet. Um, and uh, the second thing, and, 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 and so this is um, the results of Vergeles and Grianik. I think in 76. Um, and uh, by actually these people, by studying the classical model and doing some semi-classical, Arguments, they uh, were able to postulate and to check that it works on the level of perturbation theory that uh, you can produce the exact um, S matrix for this uh, theory. Uh, so it's given by a ratio of two hyperbolic tangents depending on the rapidity variable beta and some shift, so with some poles in the, in the complex plane, which are parameterized by the constant b, which is given by g squared over 2, 8 pi plus g squared, and it's between 0 and a half, where g is the classical coupling constant of the, uh, of the model. Um, This was already extremely amazing at the time because basically they argued that the singe gordon quantum field theory should have an infinite amount of conserved charges. And uh, it was uh, argued before that basically in dimensions, space dimensions higher or equal to two, as long as you have any uh, conserved quantity which is local and different from energy and momentum, then the S matrix is trivial. But this does not hold in dimension one and this was like the one of the important statements made by the discovery of Ergeles and Grianik. Okay, so once you have this, well, you, you have your Hilbert space, then you want to say something about at least elementary symmetries of your theory. So the most elementary symmetry is the translation operator. Um, so then, well, first of all, you start with a function f, uh, which you write in terms of coordinates according to the uh, Fox space decomposition of your Hilbert space. And uh, then a translation operator by a, a space-time vector y acting on f will act component-wise And um, and uh, un of t y on f n, 
will act uh, as a multiplication operator by the plane wave of um, uh, uh, space parameter y and uh, having uh, the momenta, uh, two momenta p of beta a. where um, P of beta is the two moment of M cos beta, sinh beta. So basically you can think of this, this, this theory as involving just one uh, particle of uh, mass M and just having a relativistic um, diffusion, uh, relativistic um, energy momentum relation. Okay, so we have an L square space where basically, as I said, that you want to produce some operators on your Hilbert space which satisfy certain nice uh, properties. So first, how do you realize uh, operators? Then, uh, so what you want is uh, to act with some operator or on, uh, maybe depending on the space-time coordinate x on your uh, vector f. So, well, well you will have uh, component on the zero space, on the n space, and etc. And then uh, on the n space, um, what you can do, you can allow to mix, um, to take, uh, so what you should do, you should uh, take some uh, any all possible components from, from your vector and produce the function which is an S square of Rn. So, um, So your problem of constructing operators amounts to uh, construct the operator, some, some bunch of operators which will go from L square of Rm to L square of Rn uh, and which would realize your operator, the nth component of the operator in such a way. Um, now, well, the very fact that you want to realize uh, quantum field theory imposes certain constraints on your uh, theory. In particular, the x dependence should be relatively nice. So one already knows how to translation operators act on function. And uh, what you need to require is that you have a certain translational invariance of the theory. So in the sense that the operator at space time position uh, x can be obtained by the action of translation operators on your operator at position zero, so you just you can get rid very easily of the x dependence here according to the to this case. And then, well, how, how you can hope to realize the operators? Naturally, because naturally you can try to look about for a reali realization of such operators in terms of integral uh, operators. And then uh, the problem amounts to characterizing the kernel. So let's look at the construction already, what, what gives the action of, um, uh, how, how I could write the action of an operator on the zero space. Well, according to the kind of principle there, you would get a series of uh, integrals over Rm ordered, dm of beta, and then you would have an integral kernel, so I will already write it in a specific form, the integral kernel definitely will depend on the operator you want to realize. It has a certain simpler um, dependence on x stemming from this relation and the integral kernel integrates versus the function fm of beta uh, and because of uh, certain principles of um, quantum field theory you want to enforce to hold on your model, you, um, this actually, this F um, n is the plus boundary value of, um, of a function Fm 
of O, which in a certain sense, which maybe I will not enter into the details. Here is a meromorphic function of M complex variables, each variable taken singly. Uh, in the strip, imaginary part of beta A between zero and pi, at least. And you have a certain prescription how you should compute the class boundary value. And then more generally, well, if, if you just, uh, one just repeats this construction, uh, and this will set kind of the, 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 the um, foundations of the bootstrap program. Um, so, um, if one would like to repeat this construction for the nth particle space, then the output has to depend on n outcoming variables alpha 1 to alpha n. The n dependence is again factorized. Then one has an integral kernel, again, which depends on the operator O. Now it depends on the dimensionality of the outcoming vector and the well, integrated vector. Um, And one integrates over the function beta. Uh, okay, uh, in the case of this kernel, the situation is a bit more, more complicated. Well, one could hope that one can realize the, the quantum field theory just by having well, well defined integral kernels in the sense of, say, L square functions or something like this. But this is not the case. Here, actually, one, one needs to be rather general. So, uh, this, uh, this, this, these kernels here, well, those can be. Well, already here, you see, you have a plus boundary value of a function which is uh, meromorphic in this strip. If for some reason this function would have had poles on the real axis, the plus boundary value is well defined, but it means that this integral you have to take in the distributional sense, and more generally for n variables, you, you, you really have to understand this as a um, generalized function. But still, at least uh, in, in, in this framework, you bring the construction of your of the operators of your t in your theory to construction of functions of generalized functions. And this is where the, the full um, setting of the bootstrap program kicks in. So it's a sense of axioms you put on your theory. And so you postulate uh, the equations for f m of beta m um, and uh, more generally for the kernels m and m of alpha n beta m. So this is the postulates of your theory. You solve these equations and then you check whether you realize the quantum field theory you want to realize if you're able to produce closed expressions for this. I will not write the bootstrap axioms because well, uh, it, it, it would maybe take too much, too much time and maybe not bring much to, to the discussion, but the bottom line is that you have a set of equations. You can understand them as a Riemann-Hilbert problem for uh, a coupled tower of Riemann-Hilbert problem coupling functions of in one, two, uh, three, up to infinity uh, variables. Um, and uh, in, in this bootstrap axiom equations, the prominent role is taken by the S matrix. Actually, these bootstrap equations do not come out from a hat. You can give a kind of a formal justifications of these bootstrap equations by some general principles of, of uh, uh, formal quantum field uh, theory. But here the idea is to take it as an axiom, solve everything and check that your theory is causal and then you can compute your uh, multipoint function and that they satisfy the Whiteman axioms and in this way you get rid of all the formal aspects in, 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 uh, in the construction. And again, th th and then th one of the points of the bootstrap axiom is that actually you can express these kernels mn uh, of n, m of n, m, n and m variables only in terms of linear combinations of DFMs. So these are the really building blocks of your of the operators of your theory. And for those you have a closed expression, there is really um, a long, long history of all these, setting up of all these um, uh, things. Uh, 
kind of uh, the first steps were initiated by Karofsky and Weish. Uh, they gave a sort of incomplete set of bootstrap uh, equations. Then by uh, 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 titanic efforts of uh, Fedor Smyrnov, he was able to study uh, using integrability and um, uh, quantum Gelfi and Levitan Marchenko equations, the construction of form factors for the sine Gordon model. He was able to refine the bootstrap axiom and to arrive into a set of axioms which is fully complete in the sense that it produces uh, presumably causal quantum field uh, theory. And then there were also important ideas of Kramitov and uh, well, Kirito Smirnov added to this. Um, to this program, uh, and also well, the, 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 there was um, a, um, contributions by by by, by Zamojikov, uh, Lukyatov, and many many others. So well, the bottom line is that, for instance, uh, you can solve this bootstrap uh, program in a closed form, and the form factor associated with the exponent of gamma, the field, um, you can write it in a form like this. So you have product a lower than b up to n f of beta a minus beta b, f is some explicit function, uh, which I will not give here, but it can be constructed explicitly uh, in terms of the S matrix or in terms of a gamma function, or it has also a, a explicit uh, integral representation. And um, this Kn transform, which I have written you on top, which evaluates on a specific function Pn of um, gamma of beta n. And uh, so, as I've written before, this Fn of beta, Fn of minus beta is e to the W of beta. Uh, F is explicit, but I don't write it here. And Pn of gamma is uh, also explicit. So let me write it here just so that you see that there is a well, explicit construction possible. There is a constant which is uh, uh, also explicit, but maybe I just skip it for um, uh, because it doesn't play too much of a role. Uh, and just write the uh, well summation variable dependent uh, part. So here it doesn't depend on the betas, but it does depend on the transform variables uh, ln. And if you want other operators, you, you can propose other functions. These functions pn have to solve simple equations. Um, um, okay, so the bottom line of all this is that with the help of the bootstrap program, uh, for this, uh, you're able to construct um, integral, all, integ all operators in the sense that you're able to construct their integral kernels explicitly. And then uh, you can carry out direct calculations, which I won't uh, detail here. So in particular, if you consider the space-like regime, so x square is x uh, zero square max x one square negative, so space-like regime. Uh, then you can take the vacuum vector of your theory, knowing how your operators act. You take one operator at space-time position x, one operator at the origin, and you compute its matrix element from the vacuum vector. So the vacuum vector is the vector with component one, zero, 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 zero. Um, and using all this, you can write um, series representation for that. which take this form and un is exactly the un I showed you uh, before. So uh, the point is uh, rather as follows. You solve this bootstrap axiom and you hope you have defined a, a priori well-defined operators for your theory. But then you have to check that you can multiply them so that, 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 that they form an algebra in some sense and that you can compute their their correlation functions. So because, well, the, the, the action of, of, of an operator immediately uh, mixes up um, I mean, the action of, of an operator on a zero space already produces a vector which lives uh, on all the components of the Fock-Hilbert space, and then when you act with another operator on it and project on the zero space, you get um, uh, contributions stemming from all intermediate Fock 
basis, you immediately end up with, with series of multiple integral representations. So either just because you want to define a check that you can, that the operators form an algebra, or because you want to check that you produce well-defined correlation functions, you, you face the problem of, of, of convergence. And now, uh, well, this, at least for this, for this theory, the problem is, um, is solved. So what, what, what basically the theorem tells you then that this, the convergence of the series is extremely fast, almost Gaussian. So this is already an explanation of the, some observation, numerical observation, which was made in, in the literature uh, previously uh, which were saying that basically this, these kind of expansions for correlation functions, which are called form factor expansions, uh, uh, converge extremely fast. So we need just to compute first two, three terms and you get a very good precision. Uh, so now because you see that it converges extremely fast, so this is kind of explanation of why the numerics were working so well. Uh, the, the, the proof, so which which actually shows the convergence of the series, well, it, it, without much difficulty, you can transpose it to have the well definiteness of operator products, um, at least if they are space like separated, and um, and then I told you in the beginning in this list of hypotheses or things you need to check for your theory, you need to check the local commutativity theorem, so that two operators at uh, space like separations commute with each, with each other. So the technique for uh, doing so was developed by Kirillov and Smirnov in the mid-80s under the hypothesis of convergence. So all the algebraic manipulations on the series using some properties of the bootstrap axioms to show that the commutators uh, uh, give zero in the case of space-like regime. Uh, were developed by Kirillov Smirnov, but then at some point they had to handle because they multiply operator series, and th this in their proof was uh, conjecture. So now this kind of result allows you to uh, fill this hole in this proof. So you, it really ensures that the operators produce, um, do commute uh, on the rigorous grounds at space time separations. And well, then immediately one would like to ask about uh, uh, maybe filling up uh, completely the, um, checking out the full set of Whiteman axioms for the theory. So this means computing the multipoint functions and checking the convergence properties of series of multiple point functions. So in principle, it's doable, but there will be some technical steps uh, involved. Uh, and also uh, the case of the time-like regime where now x square will be strictly possible, positive in principle is within the grasp of the technique of uh, asymptotic analysis of multiple integral, but it's uh, already a bit more complicated because the integral you get uh, for that problem, uh, you do not integrate over Rn anymore, but over a curve in the uh, complex plane. Uh, and maybe... Um, uh, yeah, so maybe maybe I will not go so much into the uh, details of the proof. Um, just uh, give you a bit of a of a flavor. So the idea is that um, uh, uh, the, the idea is to inspire oneself from from uh, techniques which were fruitful in the study of random matrices. So in particular, in this case. One is uh, interested in integrals over spectra of uh, large uh, emission uh, orthogonal or symplectic uh, invariant uh, matrix, um, matrices. Uh, so V is some confining potential in this case, and you have a two-body interaction, which is um, of uh, van der Mond type raised to some power beta, and applications to random matrices correspond to beta equals one, two, or four. Uh, and there were developed um, uh, techniques uh, uh, in the literature which allow you to bring this kind of, uh, the, the calculation of the leading order of Zn uh, of uh, V to a certain minimization problem of a, of a functional living on the space of uh, probability measures on uh, R. Roughly speaking, the uh, idea is that you can uh, write this 
multiple integral, you can uh, decide not to integrate over the diagonal because, because it's of Lebesgue measure zero. And uh, you can write it as uh, e to the minus n squared times um, Uh, certain functional on the space of uh, probability measure, uh, which is integral of v of s d mu of s minus beta over 2. You integrate, but for outside of the diagonal of log of s minus t, d mu of s d mu of t. And then the idea is that uh, ln is a sum of direct masses uh, with weight 1 over n, so it's a probability measure of on r. Uh, point such measures are actually dense in the space of probability measures on R, so you can expect that actually this integral will localize in the minima of this uh, functional, and it so happened that this functional has one unique minima minimizer, this so-called equilibrium measure, and you can uh, rigorously uh, prove uh, uh, results of the type uh, that log of z of v is minus n square. Epsilon, so epsilon is the same functional but without this condition as different from t of a certain equilibrium measure. So this is the min unique minimizer of epsilon in the space of probability measure and a uh, reminder log n times n using concentration of measure arguments. And then you can characterize this more, more precisely. So in this case, well, the integral is not exactly of this form. If you would have just this and this, then this would be perfect to apply these techniques with still the caveat that here you have something where the one-body interaction and the two-body interaction are at the same scale in n, not here. So you, here you need to rescale variables and you gain the problem of n dependence in the two and one-body interaction. But you also have a coupling here. So we have, a, have to find a good way to actually majorate this Kn of p in terms of some quantity for which you can um, hope to apply or at least general, generalize the scheme of ideas. It's possible to do so. You get something like a two-species random matrix uh, model which bounds the absolute value of this, this guy. Then you can use this kind of techniques to show this kind of estimates. But the caveat is that in this case, you have um, uh, just an independent um, energy functional, and you have an independent minimizer. So if you want to be sure that uh, what you compute in this case is actually really the leading asymptotics, and it's not just eaten up by this, because it could be that if everything here depends on n, then this just go faster to zero than this. Uh, well, you need to really compute the minimizer and, 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 and then evaluate the large n behavior of, of, of this. Uh, the sit setting is a bit more complicated than in the case of random matrices because uh, you have to solve a truncated Wiener Hopf uh, uh, singular Wiener Hopf equation, but you have the whole arsenal of the school of uh, Klein, which allows you to do so through matrix valued Riemann Hilbert problem. You can analyze the large end behavior through dive zoom on linear steepest descent, and then you get the leading asymptotics for the one major end of this, this guy, and basically that's the end of the story. Thank you for your attention. Any question? Um, I'm not understood. What is the role? Is this P playing any role in the end? Uh, d d this P, you mean in, in the... Uh, yeah, it looks it like in the end there is no dependence at all on the operator. Or no, no, because actually the operator is... is, is the well, typically the operators will grow like exponential of uh, linear in, in the beta A. Uh, and uh, for convergence properties, there's no, no, no dependence on the, on the, on the operator uh, be because they don't, don't appear in the bound, simply because what happens is that um, when you are in the integral at finite values of uh, beta, then uh, you have a strong repulsion. So if you have many integration variables which are close one to the other, then this is kind of an overkill because it goes uh, Gaussianly fast to, to zero if many of the variables are close to each other. So what you need to do, you need to spread the variables. But as soon as you start spreading, the Koch term kicks in, and it's really the behavior at infinity of the functions which, uh, which plays a role. So you, you try to spread the integration variables with a factor depending on n. And because this is much more powerful than 
this guy, this doesn't play a role. So in a sense, convergence is not, not, not really depending on, on the operator input, at least if you use you, you, you solutions which are well tamed in a, in, a, in a sense. Yeah, so relatedly, could you make your uh, theorem stronger by, by showing that this will apply to actually any local operator in the theory? Or? Uh, because here you were playing with particular operator, like this exponential operator. Oh yeah, but, but, so here I just just took an example of of of, of, um, of an operator, but but you can take there's a list of p functions which were produced like by uh, Karovsky, Babujan, also by by Lukianov, and uh, for all these functions, and and also Lashkevich, Pugai, and and for all these cases you 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 have the bounds and does the associated kind of form factor expansion for the associated operator. Ah, okay, so the theorem is valid for any local operator, you say? Uh, yeah, ba basically, yeah, okay. yes. Thanks. Other questions? Okay, thank you then.